Now, please welcome to the podium Furman University President Elizabeth Davis. Good evening, and welcome to the third and final night of the Riley Institute and Ollie at Furman's Straight Talk series, Our Fragile Democracy. Thank you for being here tonight as we move from an examination of threats to our democracy to a discussion of how we can defend and reform our democracy. I'm particularly de delighted to introduce tonight's session because it aligns so well with Furman's recently announced on discourse campus initiative, highlighting healthy ways to disagree with individuals who embrace a different point of view. Last week, you heard from Secretary Raffensperger, a lifelong conservative, and Larry Norton, a liberal, about how they both seek secure elections that build public confidence, even though they may not agree on many issues of public policy. Tonight, you'll hear first from Professor Nick Davis about his research that provides a typology for about how Americans think about democracy. Then you're going to hear a conversation between Furman alumnus Austin Weatherford, a career Republican until who until recently was Chief of Staff for Representative Adam Kinzinger, and Jonay Wartell, a pro-democracy strategist who spent 15 years working on campaigns for Democratic candidates. I can guarantee you Austin and Jonay do not agree on a number of policy issues. However, we don't have to agree with others to respect them and to collaborate with them. In fact, it's helpful for our democracy if we listen with curiosity, empathy, and respect to others with opposing views. I think you'll see that model tonight. Thank you to our students who are in the lobby this evening representing various political organizations on campus. Students, here's your chance to demonstrate your commitment to the basic elements of a liberal arts education, even or perhaps especially if you have firmly held political views, I invite you to practice curiosity, empathy, and respect as you listen to our speakers this evening. Our moderator once again tonight is Dr. Danielle Vinson, a professor of politics and international affairs. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome as she comes to the podium to introduce tonight's first speaker. Thank you, President Davis, and good evening. We've spent the last couple of weeks hearing about the threats facing our democracy from election deniers and false information spread by them in some media outlets. We've focused on the importance of the rule of law in safeguarding our constitutional democracy, and we've drawn attention to the repercussions felt at the state level as election workers have been threatened and public confidence in elections has declined. As we, as we turn our attention this week to defending and reforming our democracy, I want to mention something that you may have noticed in the news recently. Last Thursday, the organize, organizations behind nearly every presidential library dating back to Herbert Hoover, that's before my time if my students are in the room, <laughs> they all issued an unprecedented joint statement calling for a return to civility and democratic principles. This joint statement in support of the rule of law and protecting the rights of all people was signed by 13 presidential libraries. That's Democrats and Republicans. The statement notes that support for democracy worldwide is, quote, undermined when others see our own house in disarray. We do need to get our own house in order, but how do we do it? We'll tackle that topic tonight. First, we're going to take a step back and consider what it is that we as Americans want in a democracy and what we think about when we think about democracy. We all know what we mean by democracy, but if you were to turn around and ask the person sitting two rows behind you what they think, you might be surprised by the answer. So while we may not agree across the country or even right here in the room about what democracy means or what, it bene what its benefits are, we can benefit from trying to understand the various ways we think about it. And to help us do that tonight, our first speaker is Dr. Nicholas Davis. 
a lot of Davises tonight. Dr. Davis is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Alabama. His research focuses on political psychology, public opinion, ideology, and democratic beliefs. Dr. Davis is the co-author of the book, Democracy's Meanings, How the Public Understands Democracy and Why It Matters. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Nicholas Davis. Well, thank you for that uh, kind uh, welcome. I suspect I have the easier job tonight uh, in trying to unpack for you what the public thinks about democracy, which is certainly uh, easier than trying to come up with uh, solutions that uh, all people might uh, accept about it. The story I want to uh, start with tonight uh, involves what my fellow colleagues, scholars, have written about democracy over the last 10 or 15 years. And what you'll note is that when you look at many of these titles, what's gone wrong with democracy, America's failing experiment, uh, the people uh, versus democracy, uh, why our freedom is in danger, deficits, how the states are laboratories against democracy, and uh, maybe most bleakly, how democracies die, um, which is actually a, a great book about how backsliding unfolds across the world. You see a, quite an alarmist tint in this, um, and it is uh, something that we also see from the mass media. Um, when you look at various outlets ranging from the Washington Post to The Hill, uh, to Fox News, uh, to the Pew Research Center, to Vo oh, how many of these are there? I forget. Uh, gosh, it's everywhere. Um, it tends to be the case that when people uh, are reporting on Americans' democratic attitudes, there's a lot of doom and gloom. And it seems, uh, perhaps, that Americans are pessimistic about democracy. So here is some polling from the Associated Press in Newark from July of 2023, which says that 45% of adults are unhappy with how democracy is working and believe that most Americans uh, aren't being uh, well represented. 53% say Congress is doing a poor job of upholding democratic values. 74% of panelists said that the country was headed in the wrong direction. And when you ask, uh, the, the public uh, about who should make laws, 71% believe that laws should reflect what most Americans want, so that laws should reflect public opinion, while only 25% think that laws should reflect what lawmakers want. Now that's a curious disconnect. Here is some polling from Brightline Watch, uh, which is uh, an outfit of uh, scholars who study these, uh, these issues uh, that is going to uh, uh, juxtapose how experts, the public, and then partisans rate democracy. And what you'll see is some stability, but if we're assigning grades, it looks like democracy is vacillating somewhere between a C and a D plus. Here are expert and public ratings of the U.S.'s democratic performance. And so we have on this y-axis um, all sorts of uh, things that we might think are important in democracy. And we can see huge disconnects here between what the experts in our studies, these are political scientists, say and what the public says when it comes to things like government stats aren't influenced or free speech. We see a quite a big delta between what the public thinks uh, is occurring in democracy versus what experts tend to think. And this polling tends to raise some thorny questions for us as we try to think critically about what the public actually wants from democracy. When asked to evaluate democracy, what do Americans actually mean by that word? What do they tend to expect from democracy? And are Americans sour about democracy as a system of self-government, or are they more upset about how it's performing right now? So we have two goals today, all right, to try to unpack whether it's all doom and gloom about Americans' attitudes towards democracy. The first is I'd like for us to think critically about how ordinary people tend to understand democracy. And the second thing we're going to do is unpack a framework for interpreting how to think about this democracy polling. So part one, what does democracy mean? Well, a fundamental challenge for investigating support for democracy is this. Are Americans talking about the same thing? When I ask my freshman in a large intro to American government class, what do you think of democracy? I inevitably get some shouts from the back. It's a republic, not a democracy. Okay, fair enough. Um, but is there something more there? What, what is it that people tend to expect from this concept? Um, if we're cynical, like perhaps Orwell was, he writes that in a case of, of the word like democracy, not only is there no agreed upon definition, but the attempt to make one is often resisted from all sides. 
Words of this kind are often used in a consciously dishonest way. That is, the person who used them has an idea of what they mean, a private definition, but allows his hearer to think he means something different. So what characteristics do people actually associate with democracy? Well, we can try to answer that question by investigating what people think about democracy using rigor and social science tools. So to decipher what it means, we can use things like surveys, all right? And we can ask people, just sort of plainly, what comes to mind when you hear the word democracy? Here's a word cloud of some data we collected in the 2016 CCS survey, and you will probably not be shocked to see that freedom tends to be the one word that people associate with democracy, um, closely followed by, I guess, this little BS. Um, but there are other words, right, in this word cloud that are important, right? We have things like equality and government, justice, responsibility, having, all right, um, which carry some implications we'll talk about in a moment. Liberty, fairness, um, and some maybe less positive things, lies, right, messy, rule. It tends to be the case that people have all sorts of ideas that come to mind uh, when we ask them what they think about democracy. So how can we organize them? Well, we have a couple different options. And one of the things that we did is we asked close-ended questions, quite literally just asking people, do the following characteristics strike you as something that ought to be associated with democracy? So what to ask about? Well, people generally laud democracy's institutions. Everybody loves elections and protection of rights, right? Freedoms, uh, freedoms of speech, uh, press, religion. These are, of course, things that are baked in deeply to our Bill of Rights. Um, but is that it? Is that the extent of our imagination when it comes to something like democracy? Or does it have something to do with citizens' material conditions? Is democracy just a cold system of elections where parties win and lose and hopefully folks concede defeat, right? Or does democracy involve something more? Well, Jefferson, in a letter uh, to Madison in 1785, um, has some interesting things to say about a democratic system. He writes that where, whenever there is in any country uncultivated land and unemployed poor, it's clear that the laws of property have been so far extended as to violate a natural right. The earth is given as common stock for man to labor and live on. We must take care that other employment be furnished to those that are excluded from the process of appropriation. Invoking the idea, right, that self-rule with massive amounts of material inequality is going to stress a political system probably beyond the bounds of which it is capable uh, to govern itself. And academic research is pretty clear that there is a link in fact, between economics and democracy. We know that inequality and democratization go hand in hand in countries where there uh, are high levels of inequality, democracy oftentimes struggles. We know that where there are high levels of inequality, there are oftentimes low levels of social trust and trust in governing institutions. So do citizens imagine a democracy as a system of self-rule that only promotes civil well-being, or do they also connect it to material well-being? Well, to answer those questions, we developed a battery of survey items called the Essential Characteristics of Democracy. And we sampled 1,000 people. That was our, our sample for this particular survey. And we ran this survey several times and replicated these results. Um, but we started with a sample of 1,000 people, which was nationally representative, which meant we had enough uh, folks from across a wide variety of demographic uh, attributes that, that relatively matches to our census characteristics. And here's what we find, that there's lots of consensus around things that are essential. So free elections, more essential. Competitive elections, important. The right to participate, important. Probably not a shocker here, all right? Religious freedom, uh, very important, right? Freedoms of the press and speech, also important. And then we threw in some questions about redistributing taxes, providing uh, basic necessities, and a question about whether democracy involved reducing inequality. And what we find is that, ooh, much less consensus here, all right? This is a bimodal distribution, right? This is tends or uh, somewhat flat here in the case of uh, reducing inequality. And so we thought, well, okay, that's fine. We can draw a few broad conclusions here. And the first of these is that when it comes to the procedural elements of democracy, that's elections and freedoms, there's lots of agreement. But when it comes to the substantive nature of democracy, ooh, there's much less agreement. And so we asked ourselves, 
Okay, is this all there is to it? Is there something else that we can press in further? How do we make sense of these attitudes in a way that's holistic? Is it possible to parcel people into various groups of democratic meanings that have something to say about democracy more broadly? Our work in Democracy's Meanings challenges a folk theory of democracy that suggests that, well, people generally tend to agree on what the parameters of democracy is. And so in our case, we did set out to create a typology of different views about democracy involving both what it is and what it does. So I will spare you all the technical details of cluster analysis. We used a, a fancy little technique called latent class analysis. Um, uh, the upshot is this. We found four categories of views about democracy. First of these was indifferent. These are people who answered our survey who just chose the midpoint on all these items. Whether they didn't care or they were just hoping to be paid for the survey, I don't know. These are our people, though, without very well-formed views of democracy, about 10% of our sample. The second is a procedural group who understand democracy only in terms of rights and liberties and not at all in terms of the way in which democracy might uh, distribute uh, material resources to a citizenry. By far, uh, the largest category was folks with a social view of democracy. That is a view of democracy that involves democracy regulating both civil freedom, civil, uh, civil well-being, and the material well-being of a citizenry. In between these two groups are moderates who tend to, on questions of inequality and the redistribution of wealth, uh, to shade a little bit more uh, progressive. And so what we tend to find uh, among these groups is that the democracy topology wasn't just tapping into partisanship. Um, curiously enough, when we looked at the partisan breakdown, so that's whether you identify as a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, when you look at the distribution of partisanship in these groups, it was actually fairly heterogeneous. Like partisanship just did a very poor job in explaining why people wound up in these groups. The second thing that we found is that it seems clear that people want more from democracy, but they're maybe not sure that they're getting it. Our social and moderate groups believe government when we ask them questions about, well, should government be doing more across lots of different policy areas? The answer was yes, that both folks in the social and moderate groups thought that government should be doing more on poverty, healthcare, infrastructure, and the economy. That's roughly 70% of the sample that thinks that democracy ought to be doing more than it is. So, as we transition to part two, perhaps it's less the case that we're upset with democracy when people say, oh, I'm dissatisfied with democracy. Perhaps it's less the case that we're dissatisfied with democracy as a form of government, and instead more dissatisfied with the way it's operating in practice. When it comes to support for democracy, there are several ways that scholars try to attack this, and it involves the distinction between what democracy is, its outputs, uh, and what it does, all right? And the first of these is specific support, which involves evaluations involving how democracy is performing. And so when we ask the public, hey, are you satisfied with democracy? We can do this a couple ways. Um, here I've broken this out by whether you are the in party, you're uh, the part of the party that is currently enjoying the presidency, and the out party, you're the, you're the losers, right? And what we tend to find is that uh, folks who are a part of the winning coalition are much more satisfied with folks than folks who are part of the out party. Uh, no surprise there, right? If democracy, the satisfaction with democracy, these specific outputs, if they're just a contemporaneous evaluation of what's going on in the world, then yeah, I, this tracks the idea that people who are not in power would be less satisfied with democracy. That's actually somewhat reassuring because it suggests that when people say they're dissatisfied with democracy, they're not ready to toss the baby out with the bathwater. The second way we can measure support for democracy involves diffuse support or evaluations of a thing's worth in and of itself. And so David Easton, a political scientist, they're not famous, but as famous political scientists go, is responsible for this distinction between specific and diffuse support. And diffuse support is valuable because it tells us whether or not people are willing to retain an object for its inherent worth. So when we ask people, hey, is expert army or strong leader rule a good thing, they tend to reject this, all right? They tend to say that expert rule is bad, unelected expert rule, that army rule is bad, and that strong leader rule is bad. And when we ask them, do you think democracy is a good way of running the country, or that democracy is better than the alternatives, whew, ah, people also respond positively, right? They love democracy. So on balance, Americans are apparently dissatisfied with the outputs of democracy, but still believe in the principles of democratic rule and democracy itself. 
So citizens' dissatisfaction with democracy actually, to try to to kind of provide some context here, actually fits in with how they rate other institutions uh, in America today. So this is GSS, General Social Survey data, uh, over the last 40 some years for religion, medicine, education, uh, the press, oof, that's brutal. Uh, Congress, uh, no, no shock there. Uh, the Supreme Court took a big nosedive here recently. Um, I mean, this is, this is not great, right? But if we are dissatisfied with the way these things are working, if we also see dissatisfaction with the magic word democracy, we might sort of take a step back from the ledge and say, okay, hold on just a second. Maybe folks are unhappy with how this institution is performing, not that they're ready to just toss it in the waste bin of history. Norris, Pippa Norris, um, is well known for her concept of democratic deficits, which helps describe this disconnect, right? It's a scenario where promises are not met by practice. And so I think it's possible to contextualize some of this democratic angst um, uh, just by looking at several 21st century episodes, all right? The 2000 election, which involved the Supreme Court adjudicating uh, a presidential uh, outcome. 9-11 in the Iraq war, the 2008 housing market crash, uh, Barack Obama's election, and then the backlash after that election. The 2016 election and everything that it encompassed. The Trump presidency, the COVID-19 pandemic, and then of course uh, the Capitol riots in January 2020. Now, obviously these events are partisan, but they're not just partisan. Each one of these events has consequences for how we think about the performance of our government. And when you stack a whole lot of very contentious, very difficult circumstances on top of one another, it probably stands to reason that people are going to look at the institution that's mired in gridlock, right, as not performing very well. They are dissatisfied. And it's pretty obvious that partisans approach these events differently. And so when we talk about support for democracy and whether or not it's a partisan matter, um, a lot of this tends to hinge on things like question wording, the concept of study, and the temporal context in which we're looking. If we're asking about general support for democracy, people tend to profess a love for democracy. When we ask them, though, are you willing to accept leaders that engage in breaking sort of cherished values or norms that sort of uh, tend to guide democracy, people get a little squishier, all right? And so it is true that um, attitudes and what we can say about the positivity of people's beliefs about democracy are going to be very sensitive to things that we know that all polling is sensitive to. And so when we think about how to contextualize support for democracy as consumers, right, um, who, folks who read the, the, who read the news, who, who are paying attention to polling, these are just some things that we can try to keep in mind to make sense um, of this big picture. So um, to try to land the plane here, America Americans do love democracy, but it depends a a lot on what democracy they are imagining. The crisis, of our, uh, demo- the crisis of democracy reporting that we tend to see a lot of can have an alarmist tint. Um, and it is true that partisans will excuse some things that don't seem good uh, for democracy. But we should remember at least two things, all right? Public opinion is a function of when and how the media frames issues, which is relevant to democracy. So this is gonna be difficult to see, but this is the New York Times coverage of where the candidates stand on major issues, on things like abortion, China, climate change, all this good stuff. Curiously missing, democracy, right? Like we just had January 6th and we had a large, we have a commission and we have some real questions about the stability of American democracy and the media is not talking about democracy being a part of this at all. Or we have the president's recent, by most measures, successful trip uh, overseas and we're talking about his age and it being an early evening, oh, right? Um, Democracy struggles when the media takes its eye off the ball and chooses to focus on scandal coverage, right? On things that aren't necessarily relevant to democratic uh, behavior. The other thing that I think is really important to think about when conceptualizing Uh, democratic support is how our elites themselves talk about democracy. So um, this is our friend Joe Manchin. Uh, Do we really want to live in an America where one party can dictate and demand everything and anything at once whenever it wants? Well, um, I don't know, maybe like that's how majoritarianism works, right? Like if you vote the most people into office, that it tends to be the case that uh, if we are matching representational power to uh, numeric majorities, that would tend to be how that works, right? 
Now, it's bedrock principle of democracy, and our current political system sustains minoritarian rule, which can be a check and balance, which can be very important, right? And so our, our lovely um, panel this evening will, will sort of dig into some of those issues. Um, but stretched to its limits, right, some of these strains can really damage uh, people's sense of the fragility uh, with which their system uh, is currently exhibiting. Um, Trying to look ahead, it's unclear whether there's much cause for optimism. Certainly some people in the United States hold problematic views that are at odds with democracy. Um, and although Republicans on our survey measures do exist robust support for democracy in principle, um, there is the, and I'll use scare quotes because it's a matter of opinion, um, the problem of Donald Trump. Um, this is from Axios, the former president. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, whoever that graphic designer was deserves a fat raise. Um, he is polling, right? Polling very, very well. Um, and so we ask ourselves, how can people who profess a love for democracy uh, still support someone who seems antagonistic towards it? Um, well, the rub is that support for democracy is probably a second order good, all right? Um, partisanship and political power, um, our impulse to retain power is probably stronger than our sympathies for democratic principles when push comes to shove. And that's not true of everyone, but if it's true of enough people, then that can really spell uh, big trouble for democracy. And I think it means that we need to be sort of more creatively oriented towards what democracy means. Notwithstanding that challenge, there is broad support though for measures to make democracy more resilient. This is support for uh, HR1, and we see uh, even among uh, Republicans, there is support for some of these things like reducing gerrymandering, giving the public more information about who's lobbying the government, empowering small donors, and, and making voting easier. It is the case that the public is receptive to some of these procedural changes that would make its democracy uh, stronger. Ultimately here, I think our, our, our challenges are threefold. Um, challenges facing democracy are, are, are probably partially a function of a, a minority of the public that's going to accept norm breaking. Um, and so not all of the public is going to behave in good, small d democratic ways. And that, that can be a problem. Okay, I, I, I grant that. Um, but the second and third things I think are more worrisome. The second is entrepreneurial elites who don't practice what they preach. And the third is ossified institutions that decouple representational power from majoritarian public demands and make democracy harder than it needs to be. I don't know that we can do much about one and two, but certainly when it comes to three and thinking about how our institutions um, mediate uh, representational power, how they turn votes into seats, um, and how difficult we want it how difficult we want to make the practice of democracy for our public are certainly things that we need to think about with respect to making democracy stronger uh, and more uh, resilient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for helping us understand that range of ideas that are encompassed in the term democracy. Now I want to invite Austin Weatherford and Janae Wartell to the stage uh, for our conversation. Uh, as they come to the stage, please remember that if you'd like to ask questions, you can use the QR code on the back of your program. It's also supposed to be on the screen. We've heard from the professor what the research shows about how Americans think about democracy. And now we're going to hear from a couple of practitioners, people who are involved in civic work, to find ways to strengthen our democracy. Austin Weatherford is a 2004 graduate of Furman University, where he was chair of both the Furman and South Carolina College Republicans. He spent 18 years working in Congress, including 12 years as Chief of Staff for former Representative Adam Kinzinger. And thus, he also played a role in defending our democracy during Representative Kinzinger's vocal opposition to former President Trump's claims of voter fraud and attempts to overturn results of the 2020 election. With Representative Kinzinger, Austin co-founded Country First, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization lifting up moderate voices to overcome the extremes that often dominate our politics. This summer, he was appointed the president and CEO of America 250, a nonpartisan initiative working to engage every American in the 250th anniversary of the United States. He's joined by Janae Wartell, a longtime Democrat who spent 15 years involved in Democratic campaigns. 
She was the director of the Georgia Senate runoff campaigns for Senators Ossoff and Warnock in 2020, and some of you may remember that bled into 2021. She served in leadership roles on the 2008, 2012, and 2016 Democratic presidential campaigns and was involved in Stacey Abrams' 2018 gubernatorial bid. Currently, she's a partner at ARC Initiatives, a public affairs and communications firm where she specializes in developing and implementing comprehensive electoral strategies and civic engagement campaigns to promote pro-democracy efforts, advance voting rights, and build grassroots coalitions. Austin and Jonay, welcome, and thank you for being with us tonight. I want to start by asking each of you to tell the audience about what you do and how you see your current work and your previous work as supporting and strengthening democracy in America. Jonay, we'll start with you. Thank you, Dr. Vinson, and good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to share this evening. Um, as mentioned, I've spent um, the greater part of the last nearly two decades um, working as a campaign organizer and political strategist on numerous electoral campaigns. In my current role as a consultant and strategist, I work with campaigns, elect, uh, cam electoral campaigns, um, advocacy campaigns, as well as um, coalitions and C3 and C4 organizations to build and develop and execute civic engagement campaigns. And that's anything from uh, voter registration to voter education and obviously voter mobilization. And so um, my work has taken me from working in grassroots organizations across the country to now helping to develop strategies to maximize participation in our democracy. And I really feel like that has given me a unique vantage point to understand how people see our democracy um, through the lens and through the eyes of the voters and how we maximize engagement and participation so that we can improve those numbers that Dr. Davis talked about earlier. So I'm excited to be here and pleased to share. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vincent. And it's amazing to be here at McAllister Auditorium. For many years, I was bringing very conservative firebrands to this stage, uh, Republican primary uh, debates, and so it's, it's an honor to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, following my work um, in Congress, or after January 6, actually, uh, Congressman Kinzinger and I agreed that something needed to be done. There weren't enough people that were waking up to the realities of the dangers in the system. Not enough moderates. I don't, moderates is not the right term, actually. It's, it's people that were just not awake to what was happening with the extremes taking cold and control of Congress. And so uh, uh, Mr. Kinzinger and I started Country First, which is a, a movement focused on finding, finding those people that need to be more engaged in the primary system and uh, getting them activated and then, and then educate and then teaching them how to run for office in a local way or in a state way. And so um, that's, that's what I've been working on, and now I'm uh, leading the effort to uh, commemorate the 250th uh, an uh, anniversary of our country in 2026. And I see that as a milestone where we can come together as a family again. Uh, one of our commissioners often says uh, 2026 should be like a big family reunion where you may not always uh, talk to that aunt or uncle. Uh, you may you know, have a beef with that cousin, uh, but you still show up and you're still part of this, uh, this big, uh, big America. And so uh, I'm excited to be doing that. And hopefully everyone will participate in, in 2026. We heard from Dr. Davis about procedural democracy and the importance of institutional guardrails to safeguard our democracy to ensure participation. Some states are trying new approaches um, to primaries and elections that may shift the balance of power uh, toward more moderate voices. Uh, what do you see as promising viable avenues of change um, in how we conduct elections in this country and what are going to be the challenges of these reforms? Austin, we're going to start with you here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Dr. Davis was saying uh, earlier, to, earlier. He is really describing the issue, which is it's not that the, our, the system is broken and that people don't want democracy to work. It's that the, the political parties are broken and there's not enough people that are wanting to participate. You're seeing a huge growth of the number of independents who, who are uh, registering in independent versus Republican or Democrat. And so that's starting to build out 
a, a whole sector of people that want change. And 86% uh, of the current congressional districts are non-competitive. And that's due to how, that's due to gerrymandering, that's due to the primary system. Um, three out of four Americans, as we saw, um, don't trust the federal government. And so that's a, that's a systematic change. So I'm going to start off by, you know, just go ahead and saying, I think we've got to change the primary system because that's where a lot of the problems are. And we're seeing that in a lot of places across the country that's happening in um, Washington, D.C., in New York City, uh, in Nevada. Uh, they're starting to think about ranked choice voting uh, and how that can actually uh, improve who's, who's, uh, who's coming to power. And uh, so I'm all for that. I think that's, that's a, a way forward. And uh, you know, excited to talk more about how we can, how we can get there. Jenny, what are your thoughts on that question? Well, I think to the point of maximizing participation in democracy, I think we have to, to lower the barrier, particularly for representation in the primary process. When you think about these districts where um, no one is stepping up to run because of prohibitive primary processes, I think we see where that barrier to representation, representative democracy exists. And when you think about um, how in a lot of districts you don't have um, competitive elections, when you think about how primary processes and caucuses and party structures actually keep people outside of participating in democracy, either through stepping up to run or voting for a candidate that they see on the ballot as representing their values, we have to have more ideas coming to the forefront through more candidates running, more representative conversations of ideas. And I think for a lot of states across the country, whether they're red-leaning states or blue states, I think you see kind of this deficit of participation, particularly when it comes to the caucus and primary structures, because they're prohibitive. They're complicated. People don't understand them. And what do you do when you don't understand something? Something. You check out or you select and you, you opt out, right? And so I think some of these reforms are, are going to lower the barriers to participation, whether it's through voters, caucus systems, or whether it's just to making sure that we can have um, access to ballots for candidates who want to step up to run. So I think not all of these reforms, I think, will see the yield in the immediate term. Some of these reforms will take multiple cycles, um, but I think a lot of them are moving in the right direction toward maximizing participation. Yeah, it's, it's about opening the primary system. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we've got to have more people engaging in the primary. When you're choosing uh, who's, running, who's going to Congress with just three or four percent of the electorate, that's not going to get you the solutions that you want. And I think that's really the issue that we're having is no one's getting to those solutions. And so they're getting so frustrated that they want some change. They have to, you know, they'll, they'll go for whoever is best and whoever can, can take that challenge. And so uh, opening up the primaries, allowing everyone to vote uh, in the primaries, and then, and then maybe going on to the general and having a, a ranked choice or final five instant runoff sort of system will allow for some will allow for that participation mm -hmm. and we'll get more people voting that are not at the extremes because right now it's just the extremes that are voting and we want everybody to be feel like they're participating and I think just to double click on the earlier point, I think we have to make sure that we're maximizing representation from communities. Because I think a lot of times we think about these reforms systemically, and then the implementation of these reforms still disproportionately leaves marginalized communities, people who don't look like um, the majority in this country, out of right out of the process still. So I think we have to look at the reforms not just systematically and not just procedurally, we have to think about the disproportionate impact on the voices that we're not hearing and ask ourselves why, and then when we, when we find out why, attack, uh, attack those challenges head on. They're, they're singing my song up here. I love the whole instant runoff ranked choice voting. You have to realize in, in the district that we're sitting in right now, the congressional race is usually decided in the primary. We're good if we get 17% of the eligible voters to go to that primary vote. And so that's a tiny, tiny proportion choosing who's going to be our representative. Yeah, that's 17%, that's but then who went, you know, out yeah. of that, like, yeah. what's the winner getting yeah, out of that exactly. 17%? Exactly. It's huge. Um, 
So it, it is a tiny, tiny proportion making these choices for, for the whole district um, in many cases across the country. Um, I want to talk a little bit about people's expectations for democracy. Um, Jone, you consult with uh, organizations seeking to promote pro-democracy pro efforts. Uh, what have you heard in conversations with others about what they envision in a democracy? Um, how are voters talking about these, these barriers to voting and, and registering and things like that? Yeah, I think that we have reached a point in a moment in our country where people are seeing democracy so much through this lens of polarization and this lens of partisanship. And when they think about their level of dissatisfaction with the way that democracy is functioning, right? We don't disagree on the principle of democracy. We, dis we disagree on how it's functioning in, in, in real time. And so I think that one of the biggest things that um, folks who ex have expressed dissatisfaction with their representation or how government is functioning feel like they don't have folks in chambers all across the states um, all across the country and also federally who are really representing their values. And so one of the things that I work with civic engagement um, planning and um, developing, developing and executing civic engagement plans with clients is figuring out how do we maximize the amount of people who are educating themselves about the issues, educating themselves about the candidates, and finding ways to maximize participation on election day or early voting or mail-in voting. But we find that there's a lot of barriers. And I think that what people come to expect from their democracy is that fundamentally using their voice shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be difficult. There shouldn't be inherent barriers to getting to the ballot box. And I think that one of the things that's been particularly distressing for a lot of the, the organizations that I've worked with is they're going to these communities and helping them to understand what's on the ballot, how to vote, when to vote, where to vote, and then they get there and there are long lines. They get there and they're turned away. They get there and they find in those moments that democracy feels kind of broken for them. And so I think that one of the things that we need to do to restore people's faith in institutions and systems and structures like the ones that you know that run our country is fix the broken pieces of the systems that we know are not working for vast majorities of the electorate you know having worked a great deal in the south i'm from the south i'm a proud georgian and i have family all over the south you know when you think about their participation in our democracy it's it's characterized largely by voting and when they think about, is democracy working for me, if they don't see their ideas represented through you know, their representatives that they're sending to the state house or the state senate or to Congress, then they're automatically thinking, well, I can't even participate fully in electing whoever that member is because I can't even vote without challenges or vote without um, you know, having, having barriers. And so I think what's important in restoring um, faith in our democratic institutions and a lot of what I work with my clients with is, is discussing how do we make sure that the administration of elections all across our country make people feel like participating does not have tremendous barriers. Because I think that at the heart of the matter is what people expect from democracy. They want to see, you know, Congress and um, legislative bodies contribute to their overall well-being, their 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 day-to-day -day lives, but they also want to elect people who understand them, who represent them, who share their ideas and values, and right now, that's a huge barrier for many, many Americans. Austin, um, as we think about the present and future of democracy, Nick noted some people say they love democracy while supporting politicians whose actions actually threaten democracy. You've had a front row seat as the guardrails of our constitutional system of government were tested in the aftermath of the 2020 election. You're also familiar with what's going on in the Republican Party and what the research shows about views toward authoritarianism and other anti-democratic norms um, that we've talked about in previous weeks. Um, is democracy a secondhand good for those who tend toward authoritarianism? What does this mean for the future of the Republican Party? How do you see the party reconciling this love for democracy on one hand, but then these sort of undercurrents of authoritarianism or at least anti-democracy floating in? So that's a great question. I think Nick answered a little bit of it, but um, 
right after I left Furman, I went to Capitol Hill. And uh, the calls that I, were, that I was getting on Capitol Hill as a young staffer were on immigration. People were so upset about immigration. This has been almost 20 years. And here we are today still talking about immigration. Uh, it's been decades since we've had solutions on immigration, student loans, debt deficit. We have these debates over and over and over again. It's in the media, but there's never a solution. So people are frustrated. And that's where the Republican Party is. They feel frustrated. Nothing's happening on debt deficit. Nothing's happening on immigration. So they're going to go to whoever's going to say that it can be fixed. And, you know, for the former president, you can agree or disagree, but he said he was going to fix it for everybody. And he was going to do whatever it took. And so I think that's where we're having a, a strain in the authoritarianism and, and, and democracy. It's because people want solutions to problems. And if you're not going to provide you know, solutions, then they're going to find somebody that will. And that's where the system needs fixing. That's where we need people in Congress that are going to be more representative of the broader public so that they see that compromise is necessary, that they see that we want to find solutions. Because right now, uh, Congress is not, I mean, you can see what's happening right now. We're about to have a shutdown because you've got a handful of people who think, you know, it's their way or the highway. And it's a perfect system. That's not how Congress was designed. It was never going to be a perfect system. There's always going to be compromise. So um, I'm worried about the Republican Party. You know, I'm, I, I'm a conservative. I'm someone that, you know, cares about debt deficit, cares about immigration. But I'm really concerned about where people are taking it and how it's a growing group of people. And I, you know, I think social media, media, those all things, you know, you, you, everyone's in their echo chamber. That all contributes to it. I think we all have a role to play in, in knowing what the facts are. I heard you earlier today say we need to speak to, uh, need to teach ourselves how to read the media, how to understand, get from as many sources as we can. So. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, and there's a lot of groups that are trying to do that work, educating voters on civics and responsibility and news, and I think more work needs to be done. I think um, it needs to be from the ground up. Did you want to say, you were smiling. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think where we are, I mean, who, who has, has watched Congress or a congressional session in the last couple of weeks or months, I think you see just this, this kind of uh, rampant, kind of obstructionist way of, of, of governing that is bringing us, I think, to the point where people feel just so dissatisfied with what they see, um, particularly with our congressional leadership. And so I think that um, because so many of the issues on how we just move our country forward, how we fund our schools, how we make sure that people's basic needs are met, how we make sure that folks have health care. So many of those conversations have become kind of these partisan footballs with our elected officials. And I'm not saying that the Republican parties are the main ones who are bad actors in this regard, but that's what I'm saying. Just give it some time. Just give it some time. That's what I'm saying. Um, I, I think that there has to be a reckoning um, with how our, our government works, as particularly in our congressional representation, because I think people are not seeing results. They're seeing a lot of sound bites, they're seeing a lot of obstructionism, they're seeing a lot of headlines, and you know, they're not seeing results. And so I think that a lot of the dissatisfaction comes from people feeling like, what, what, what are we doing? What are our elected bodies really doing to improve our everyday lives, and I don't think to any satisfactory level, Congress has been able to answer that question. And I don't think it's it's specific just to the Republican Party, but I certainly think we have to move out of this posture and this culture of obstructionism and saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll stop things from getting done as long as we can't get what we want. You are sent but to... But you're, you're not going to change... I mean, that's not going to happen until you have better people in yeah, office. Well, you have better people, so. but it's also not going to happen until the, the majority of folks who are pursuing sensible solutions silence those who are obstructionists and those who are taking, taking hostage the brand 
of what it is to be a Republican or what it is to be a conservative. So I do think that there is, needs to be a reckoning for those who are standing in the way of progress even when they don't agree, right? Because that's not a functioning democracy. This is interesting. I could go in a 40, I'm looking at my clock down here and it's like, I'm gonna have to stop at some point, so. The representatives of the presidential libraries that I mentioned earlier reminded us that each of us has a role to play and responsibilities to uphold in democracy. They encourage us to engage in civil dialogue. We're doing that. Uh, they encourage us to respect democratic institutions and rights, uphold safe, secure elections and accessibility to elections. It sounds so easy, let's all behave. Not everyone is willing to behave. And even if we are, we're gonna have some different views of what we want democracy to do. Um, as we heard from Nick, the American public is largely dissatisfied with democracy's outputs. How can we envision a democracy for the future that includes life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all of us? Um, Janet, Janet, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, how do voters view this American dream? Well, you know, the, the, the history for, you know, in looking at the history of our country, I think the American dream means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but I think what we can all agree that it means is opportunity and freedom to express our ideas, right? And just as we're having a uh, civil dialogue here, I think that um, the future of our democracies is truly in peril if we can't have conversations about the, our differences and ideas. And I think that when we think about this pursuit of the American dream, I think if we're not opening ourselves to having conversations about how we move forward collectively, instead of staying in these partisan and these polarized, you know, different sides of, of every conversation and being unwilling to come together, then I think that we, we will face challenges until we figure it out, right? And so I think in a lot of ways, um, for some people, the American dream means the freedom to express their ideas even when they're unpopular and have people disagree with them and we can still find solutions together. And I think that especially in the age, in the digital age we have now, people are, are behind their computer screens and behind their keyboards launching these grenades, right? Saying things about people, saying things to people that in a civil, that's not civil, that's not civil conversation. They're not civil, it's not civil discourse. And so I think when, when I think about this pursuit of these ideals, I think that we will continue to, um, to be unable to fully pursue those things unless we're having a marketplace of ideas. Because I think that is um, a healthy and functioning democracy. And beyond that, I think that there are still a lot of barriers systemically to, um, to everyone being heard in our democracy. Um, we talked about these procedural reforms that, that change our primary systems. I think we still have too many echo chambers around bad ideas because participation in our democracy is diminishing. People are feeling like they can't express themselves without inciting political violence or without drawing the ire of somebody who doesn't agree with them. Um, and so when I think about a functioning democracy, I think that's the places where we're, we're falling down a bit and we have to strengthen um, the discourse and the conversation. Austin, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I'm, I'm worried about the American dream. I'm worried about people not believing in it, not believing there's opportunity for America. And I think that all goes back to us, the system not working, the political parties not working. And I'm gonna back it up a little bit to the political reform question and just say the problem with political reforms like ranked choice voting and uh, instant runoff. It's like, no, that's not exciting. Like, no one's going to go out and vote for political reform. And so, one thing that we're doing at Country First is like thinking through, okay, how can we get people to think about these reforms that are going to benefit them? And uh, we're about to launch a new initiative called Mute the Mayhem. When it, when it comes to uh, political, uh, when it comes to ranked choice voting, what we are finding is the incentive structure completely changes. There's no negative ads in a ranked choice voting. Doesn't everybody here, aren't we all tired of negative ads? Would that be enough? <laughs> if, we can, if we can convince the public, which everyone agrees, I think that the system's not working right. If we can convince them, look, we can get rid of negative ads, make your whole campaign a lot nicer, you still get to vote for anyone you want, 
in the spectrum. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the majority person is going to win, the person with the most votes collectively. Um, I, think, I think we can make a difference. And so we're going we're gonna to launch that campaign in a few weeks, mute the mayhem, and uh, see if we can garner some support. But uh, yeah, I'm worried about uh, the American dream, I think, for young people, especially if you saw all of Nick's um, slides on um, what's happened in the last 20 years. Can anyone think about a really good moment in American history in the last 20 years for young people? I mean, for me, it was 9-11. I was here on 9-11. I was a sophomore. And that was a moment of unity and, and like, coming together. But besides that, I mean, Barack Obama's inauguration, I think, was a moment that everyone had some pride in this country, or a lot of people did. But what else has there been since then? And that was 2008. That's a long time, especially for people that are here uh, in college as a freshman, sophomore. I mean, what do they have to look forward to? So that's, that's where I'm worried. That's where I think, you know, we need moments of where we come together. Okay. While we have been talking, my colleague, Dr. Bouquet Oshtas, and several of our students have been compiling your questions. And so now it's time to invite our students to come ask the questions. Tonight we have Alice and Abaya. Who starts? Hello. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We are going to start with, the current system strongly favors incumbents and even rewards extremism. Is it realistic to expect the beneficiaries of the system to act to change it? Good question. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, when we talk about oppressive systems in our country, um, our, our country has a long history of reinforcing oppressive systems, particularly when it comes to marginalized communities in our country. And I think like, that's, that's a reality that I think we have to contend with and we can't ignore or have a revisionist history about. We have to confront those things. Where I think it's really important for some of the reforms that we were discussing earlier is opening up this lens of what we call representation in our democracy. That means that people should look at their state legislative or state senate or congressional representative and see their ideas and their values represented. And right now, um, there is an oppressive majority in a lot of our, our, our legislative and our congressional systems locally and federally where there is not enough actual um, discourse uh, and, and dialogue about ideas um, that are progressive, right, or that are more conservative. It's generally one or the other. And so I think for particularly um, marginalized communities, they are voiceless in many countries in our, in our, in many um, states in our country. And I think that the way to really combat um, that is to elect more representation in communities across America that are reflective of the diversity of America. And I think we're making some, some slow gains there. I, I, I think about the last, um, the last few election cycles where we elected the first of, of, of many, uh, of the first woman or the first person of color or the first openly LGBTQ um, representative in a lot of these places where they are becoming the lawmakers, they are becoming the policymakers, they are becoming the change, and it represents and reflects a diversifying America. There is real resistance to that, and I think that that goes back to our values as a country and what we put on display. So. Short answer, no, um, but longer answer, I think that we're making some progress in a lot of those key areas when it comes to representation in our democracy, but we have a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, the, the political parties have a mon monopoly, so it's, they're not gonna give it up easily. And the system's been, we've been trained in the system uh, on how it should function and um, we, we we're going to have to wake up. The, the, the country that everyone that's becoming an independent right now is going to have to wake up and say, hey, enough of this. I'm going to vote in these primaries. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to actually change the system. You can't just sit back and say, oh, the Republican Party or oh, the Democrat Party. If you live in a place that um, is a majority Republican district or a majority Democrat district and you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, you've got to go vote. You've got to go get engaged. You've got to get, uh, get elected to some right. office. Um, and so we need to wake people up to that and uh, actually get them more in the participation mode because that's the only way things are going to change. 
because the, the, the parties aren't going to fix themselves. They've, they've rigged the system. Uh, they're not going to change it. And I think to Austin's point, when we resigned ourselves to saying, oh, this is a red district or this is a Republican area, or oh, this is a Democratic district or this is a blue area, when, I, when voters are resigned to that reality or to that belief, what happens is they stop showing up. They stop believing that it's important to be a part That's of right. the conversation. And so, you know, having grown up in, um, in Republican or red districts my whole life, it never occurred to me to just sit it out, to say, oh, like my, my, my state representative is going to get elected whether I show up and vote or not. And so I think we've got to encourage people that they can't, they can't opt out, they can't sit out, they can't resign themselves to not participating because it doesn't matter, because that's how areas that seem, quote, Republican or Democrat continue to become, quote, more red or more blue is because people decide that their voice stop doesn't matter because their representative doesn't share their partisan leaning. And I think that's a really dangerous, dangerous thing. And I think that continuing to participate um, is the only way to ensure that we're continuing to challenge those conventional wisdoms and norms. Thank you very much. Our next question is, does the appointment of Supreme Court justices or their life terms negatively affect the quality of democracy or violate the, nation of, the notion of people's sovereignty? And could you share your perspective on incorporating term limits in a general sense? Austin, you want to start this one? You know, I'm going to get to both of you. I'm going yeah. to let Austin take that no, one. No, I, I don't really, I mean, I totally understand the Supreme Court um, concerns, and, but I don't think that's fundamentally where the problem lies. I mean, yes, has the Supreme Court been manipulated over the course of decades? Yes. And, um, you know, should we have people on the court for decades and decades? Uh, probably not. I mean, I think this kind of goes to, you know, your point about is this, is the, this representing our country? And um, if you look at the Supreme Court now, it's more represented than it was 20, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago. But um, I, I just don't think that's, you know, I think people get are upset with the Supreme Court because the Congress is not working and the presidency is not working. I don't think it's just because of the Supreme Court. And so the Supreme Court's having to take on these issues that everyone's seeing is not getting solved and then, you know, finding some compromise or some non-compromise solution. And so um, that's where there's a lot of angst. Uh, what, was the, what was the second question? Term limits. Oh, term limits. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, that's another, that's another hard one. I, I, it has to be a constitutional amendment, in my opinion. And I, I have the idea that we really need uh, a constitutional amendment where, you know, maybe senators get two terms of, of uh, eight years uh, and Congress gets, you know, 12 years. I, th I, think, I think there's definitely options there. Maybe the presidency is just one term of six years so we don't have to have a, a runoff. So I think there's there's some ideas. I have some ideas, but we're just agreeing civilly right now. Yeah. yeah, I'll chime yeah. in in a minute. I'll give you a chance first. I'll say yes to the term limits. I, I I don't think they should be. I think they should be rather high. But this is not even like my views on term limits aren't limited to the Supreme Court. I think they're limited to congressional and senatorial representation. Um, I can think of some senators and some members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who need to go. Um, and it's not because I, I, I'm, they need, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm no, sorry. You're right. And again, that's, that's, that's me speaking I, for my views know, on, yeah. on, on, on both sides of the aisle. And so I think that, God you know. God bless Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Mitch McConnell. How many times does this man has a short out in front of a live audience before we're like, sir, please. Everything's fine. Everything's um, fine. Every, everything is, the kids are not all right. Um, I, I think, you know, term limits are necessary. I, I think they should be extremely high. I do think that when it comes to, um, when it comes to the Supreme Court, I think it's, it's dangerous to, to think that there would be a, a lot of turnover um, or, um, a lot of changing, changing of the, the makeup of the court. Um, but I definitely 
um, think that it's very, is, is alarming to me that, you know, a decade ago, a lot of people were not paying attention to the Supreme Court, right? They knew the Supreme Court was a part of the branch, a branch of government, like they understood uh, the function of the Supreme Court. But now people know so much more about the Supreme Court because it's become so politicized. And I think that that's concerning to me because I think especially with the recent um, overturning of Roe v. Wade um, and other Supreme Court decisions that have come down recently, you know, even if you agree or disagree, um, with the actual rulings, I think there is a, a more politicized nature to some of the decisions. I know a lot of it is because of the current balance of the current makeup of conservative to more liberal justices. Um, but I really feel like um, we are in a, a problematic era of the Supreme Court where there's a lot of politicized decisions that are coming down um, that I think don't just concern me, but, but concern others who say like, is this supposed to be, isn't this supposed to be a branch of the government that is about the rule of law and less about the partisan leanings of the appointees? All right, now the moderator's gonna weigh in on term limits. Those of you in Ollie programs have heard me say this before, but I'll keep it short. See Alexander Hamilton on why you don't want term limits and remember ultimately we have term limits, folks. Go <laughs> vote them out if you don't like right. them. It's happened many times. Sitting speakers of the House have been tossed out by their constituents. Senate minority leaders have been tossed out by their constituents. It can be done, I promise. Okay. It would be all. easier if we have uh, reform in the primary, though. It would be much easier if I'm yeah. all for it. I told you earlier, yeah. I'm for it. But it would also be reform. great for yeah. it to just have term limits. No, no. And then we don't have to There's worry about There's all kinds that. of problems. <laughs> Hamilton, just go read Hamilton. Go to it. So this question is about um, monetary contributions, um, and it's two-parted. So do you think the money some candidates get from large donors negatively affect others from running for office? And also, are there any viable ways to eliminate dark money political contributions? Who wants it? Well, I, I, would, I would say to start, um, with the part of the question that, um, that pertains to um, kind of how candidates get funded. Um, when we talk about representative democracy, when we talk about having legislative bodies that look like, you know, not just the majority in this country, but also communities across America, I think one of the, the biggest challenges, and this is on the Democratic side and also on the Republican side as well, um, a lot of the reason why we see the primary field looks so um, so not representative of the communities that they're running to represent is because they have the most access to money and they have the most access to the donors who are gonna fund their campaigns. And that goes to this notion of viability, right? People wanna put money behind people who look like they're kind of gonna win in the lead, and a lot of those folks are in the lead because they have the grassroots resources from donors, high-level donors, some low-level donors as well. And so I think it, it, it does ice a lot of um, candidates out of elections because they aren't seen as viable by these major party committees, by other major donors, because they don't have the, uh, the immediate backing of big Democratic donors or big Republican donors. So I think we have to think about how is this primary process um, valuing um, people who have access to money or people who um, are themselves independently wealthy. Look at how wealthy our members of Congress are. Right? You can imagine that if they're running for re-election, they're gonna be able to raise the funds that they need to get re-elected. If someone were to come and challenge them, let's talk about vote them out. You're not gonna get rid of a sitting minority leader or majority leader very easily because they're gonna drop $20 billion to stop you from taking their seat. So the reality of the matter is viability is a real challenge when you cannot secure the level of donor support that a lot of times first-time candidates, candidates of color, candidates who are not majority candidates can secure. And so I think that's one of the big problems. I think money, money in politics is something that we've contended with for quite some time. I know there are a lot of different views here. I do think grassroots funded elections um, are going to always be the most fair. And I think they're always gonna be looked upon more favorably when it comes to 
whether people are getting elected fairly or whether they're quote unquote buying elections. So while I don't think there's a silver bullet to solve for dark money or money in politics, I do think it's something we have to continue to contend with. Austin. Yeah, I'll keep it short. I mean, I, money's an issue. I mean, you've got billionaires who can throw hundreds of millions of dollars into a campaign and, you know, means nothing to them, uh, but it means a lot to the campaign. And right now, the candidates, when it comes to dark money, they don't, they don't have control over their campaigns because uh, whoever's providing that money, they can't, you know, look at DeSantis right now. He, he can't work with his outside or uh, outside uh, pack because uh, because of the rules. So I think the candidate we need candidates to have more control over the messaging and and the money and um, the limits on candidates is like three thousand dollars per person. When you, can, you but then you set up an outside organization that takes unlimited money. So that's a problem. That's a real problem. I mean, a lot of the spending in super PACs is where you get a lot of this negative advertising and messaging. When people say, oh, I'm getting bombarded with negative messages about the Democratic or the Republican candidate in a race, a lot of times those, that's super PAC funded ads. Those are super PAC funded communications that you're getting and not actually coming directly from the campaign. So when you take, you know, when you take that dark money out of politics, whether it's on, you know, on the, the campaign side or in the super PAC funding, then I think you also drain a lot of the resources that use, that's used for a lot of this negative advertising that people are being bombarded with during election season. Thank you to our students. Um, before we wrap up with one last question from me, I want to take a minute to thank the folks who have made this Straight Talk series possible this year. Many people have worked behind the scenes. The staff of McAllister Auditorium, Nancy Kennedy from OLLI, Furman Public Safety, Professor Bouquet Oshtas, our Riley Institute students um, who've helped compile the questions, and particularly the Riley Institute staff uh, have been working tirelessly for months on this uh, event. Um, and I want to say a special thanks to Jill Fuson, who is retiring in December. This is her last Riley Institute Straight Talk uh, production. And we could not do it without her. Thank you. Our conversation over the last three weeks have caused us to focus on the fragility of our democracy. I want to end by reminding us of the promise of our democracy. And so I want to pose one last question to our guests. Why should our audience be hopeful about democracy? Austin, I'll start with you. Because we're all here today talking about it. And this is happening, this is happening. Did I take you? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's happening across the country. I mean, it's, it's someone who's trying to build a movement around this stuff. There's small little groups across the country building bridges, finding a way, a way to talk to people, having these conversations, trying to find solutions. People are waking up. People are waking up that we need to solve this problem. And so that's what's inspiring to me. And I know young people, I know the, you know, all the Furman students, I think they see the problem. They, they see that we need to make some changes. Uh, and they're more prepared than a lot of older people because they understand social media better. They understand uh, the media ecosystem. So they're going to be a little bit more uh, capable in fixing this situation. And so I'm, I am hopeful. I'm, I'm ho I think that we should all be hopeful, and certainly I'm hopeful, because I think that we have all reached peak exhaustion with business as usual when it comes to politics. Um, I, I do this work every day, and I have never been just more exhausted when I think about this hamster wheel that we're on of negative ad and political violence, and, and, and I'm sure as, as observers and people who you know, who live in your communities every day, you're, you're tired of seeing it, you're tired of hearing it. So I think that people are definitely waking up to the fact that they can be a part of the solution. Um, I'm really encouraged by conversations that I get to have in communities all across the country because I can see that while we don't always see it on a, on a large scale, on a national scale, um, I'm seeing it in communities all over the country. I'm seeing people build coalitions with people who maybe don't agree with their point of view or their political leanings on every single issue, still be able to work together to get things done. And so 
one thing I encourage myself with is when we watch the news, we're only seeing the highlight reels of the worst things that have happened in politics that day, the craziest thing that someone said. But that's not every single day, right? That's not every single day in our country. Maybe that's happening in one place in America, but there are a hundred other things that we're not hearing about where people are making real change. People are stepping up to run for office. People are making history as the first to be elected to certain positions, especially locally and nationally. And so I'm encouraged not just by what I see um, every single day in communities, but I'm encouraged that um, the generation of people who are really taking the mantle of our democracy and of political systems they're revolutionary. They are, they are not beholden to institutions in the way that folks of my generation, folks of, of more seasoned generations, I won't say older generations, they are not beholden to institutions in the way that we once were. I think they are willing to deconstruct and dismantle systems that do not serve the greater good in our democracy. I'm seeing it every day, especially at the peak of social unrest in the last couple of years, that young people and people who are determined to make change are, will, will not stop until they are heard. So I think that it is incumbent upon us to facilitate kind of this fuel, this fire that we see that is burning in our democracy for people to say, we need to do better, right? And so every single time I see an instance of that or I hear an instance of that or I I, I witness um, the, the fruits of those conversations. I'm encouraged because I know that there are still good people working for change all across the country. So that's the thing that I'm encouraged by and I think that gives us hope and people should have hope about. Thank you all for caring and being here and thank you to our guests. We hope you'll come back next year for Straight Talk. Thank you. Thank you.